Is that thing working? Yeah, it is. Okay. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been here. Yeah. Last time I was here, I said the same exact thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I was looking at the calendar, and in the last nine weeks, I've been here twice. Uh, I've been out preaching a lot, and that's one of the side effects of being a new preacher is that you tend to be popular for a bit when everybody wants to hear you preach in their church for the first time. Fortunately, as my dad said a while back, once they hear you once, they won't ask you to come back. <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah, I don't <laughs> You'll never live it down. That's what I was saying. I told that joke to three different churches, and they all busted out in laughing, and now it's, I'll never let him live that down. <laughs> Since I am a, a newly licensed minister by this church, it's my responsibility to report back about the experience that I've been gaining. And in March, I uh, preached twice at the church up in Stumptown, Mount Pisgah, and I think I was received uh, pretty well both times. I met a bunch of people I didn't know. And, uh, but they seemed to have a good spirit about them. I preached at the Henry's Fork Baptist Church over in Newton. Now, that tell you, that, that church is a fantastic church. It's as pretty as can be. They've got some of the best music I think I've seen anywhere. They've got a mandolin. They've got a guitar. And uh, it's just fantastic. Last week, I uh, preached over at the 5th Sunday meeting at Dawson, and uh, you know, had that meeting. So it's important for me to come home and preach uh, every once in a while, because I am responsible to this church, uh, but this church is also responsible to every other church that I preach at, because they, you know, we have to make sure that I'm preaching sound doctrine. And uh, while I'm sure everyone here has a lot of faith in me, it's an important part of what we do here to make sure that the Word is being preached and that God is being glorified. So I'd like for you to open your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 2. And we're going to be reading and studying out of this uh, chapter today. So 2 Samuel, chapter 2. First verse, and it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said, Unto Hebron. Now I want to give you some background information about what's going on here. In the first chapter of 2 Samuel, David has just heard that King Saul and his son Jonathan were killed in the battle of Mount Gilboa. They were fighting against the Philistines. Now David, Man. he was anointed by God to be the successor for King Saul. And so many times throughout history, when a king dies, what happens? There's a big fight to find out who takes over. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 2. But let's look at verse number 1 for a moment. David asked the Lord, Where do you want me to go? Shall I go to Judah? So when you look at this verse in the Bible, it's easy to miss the significance. I mean, it's a plain verse. I mean, it's pretty simple. He asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? That's what, that's what the verse is. It can't get any plainer than that. And we tend to think of chapters as having significance. We think of books as having yeah. significance or testaments as having significance. But the truth is that your life can be completely altered by one verse in the Bible. Amen. David asks the one important question. Lord, what do I do? We pray all the time for various things. We thank God for Jesus. We thank God for salvation. We thank God for the food that's been put in front of us. We thank God for all these things. We'll ask God for this or for that. 
But do we ask, what do I do? It's a question that mostly gets asked when we've exhausted all other options. When we can't figure it out for ourselves, and there are no other options, we break down and ask the Lord, what do I do? And I'm really starting to see this. Uh, the other day I was telling Brother John, I, I'm having trouble getting motivated to work on this sermon. And I was telling Dad, I don't even know what I want to preach about yet. I had an idea, but uh, I liked it. But I told Dad, I said, this just isn't what the church needs to hear right now. And I always remember my mom saying, now you've got a sermon coming up. You've got to, got to pray to God and have him get, ask him to give you a sermon. And uh, you'd think eventually I would start with that rather than beating my head in trying to figure out what to preach about. Been there, done that. So this is what David is doing in verse 1. He's trusting in the Lord and asking him what to do. And David is really famous for doing this. In verse 1, uh, he's asking the Lord where he wanted him to go, what he wanted him to do. For David, it was only when he didn't ask the Lord what he wanted him to do that David himself got into trouble. And that is so much our story as well waiting until we're desperate before we finally break down and talk to God. Amen. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Amen. In Thessalonians, Paul says, Pray without ceasing. Amen. So is it that hard for us to pray all the time. How are you supposed to do that? What do we do when we first wake up of the day? A lot of, a lot of people, hopefully it's some people pray, but a lot of people will think, well, I've got to go do this, I've got to get the kids ready, I've got to get food ready, I've got to get a shower, I've got to go to get to work, I've got to get gasoline, I've got, wait, 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 I've got to go to Walmart. We think about all these things that we're having to do. But before we get out of bed, after the fifth time of hitting the snooze button, maybe we ought to say, Lord, please lead me today according to your will. Amen. Lord, as I'm getting ready to cut down all these trees, keep me safe. Lord, as I travel to Charleston today with all these eggs keep me safe for travel safety. Amen. Lord, please don't let me knock a whole rack of boxes on my head again. <laughs> Lord, give me a day with less pain. We have all kinds of concerns that we should bring before God. I'm hurting. I'm depressed. I'm angry. I'm not happy. We need to talk to God. Amen. So I suggest that you run everything by God. Everything you're going to do, take that time and run it all by God before you get up in the morning. Amen. He knows it all anyway, so why not tell it? Amen. The fact is, it's a sign of faith. It's a sign of trust. It matters more to God than anything else. Tell God everything, because the Lord is always faithful. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Yeah. Our lives are full of trials and temptations. 
God uses these trials for his own purposes. <coughs> Sometimes it's to test our faith. Sometimes it's to strengthen our faith. And other times he uses the trials of life to remind us of the commitment that we've made to him. But he will never give you more than what you can bear. Amen. That's a good prayer to ask. Lord, give me strength, but don't give me more than what I can bear. Amen. We pray with faith and trust God will answer. In Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 20, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not the teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. It's a good feeling knowing that if we trust in God, He will talk to us and guide us on the way. And all of that was one verse. One verse in one chapter. One verse that can change your life if you let it. Amen. So let's read chapter, uh, chapter 2 of uh, 2 Samuel, starting at verses 2 through 7. So David went up thither, and his two wives also, and Anoam the Jezreelite, and Abigail the Baal's wife the Carmelites. And his men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of heaven. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have shown, have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show, show kindness and truth unto you, and I also will requite you this kindness, because you have done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened, and be ye valiant. For your master Saul is dead, and all the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. So when Saul was king of the whole country, it was all unified under his rule. But he no longer had the approval of God. David did. And after the death of Saul, the country was fractured, and a civil war was looming. And David became king of Judah. Verse 8 through 10. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishaboth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, and made him king of Gilead, and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ibasheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old, and when he began to reign over Israel, and reigned two years, but the house of Judah followed David. So we've got Abner, who was the head of Saul's army, sets up Saul's son to be the king of the remaining tribes of Israel. And in verse 11, And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishaboth, uh, Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon, and Joab, the son of Jeriah, and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon, and they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. Then there arose and went over by number twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ibosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. So we've got Abner who was the generals of the armies of Ishbosheth, and Joab, the general of the armies of David. And Abner is suggesting that they have a duel of sorts, or a contest between the two sides, to see who's going to win. 
sort of like the Roman gladiators that you saw later in the Bible. Twelve men against twelve men. So they're watching these men hack each other up for their own entertainment. I can tell you this, these are not good men. And in verse 16, and they caught everyone his fellow by the head and thrust his sword into his fellow's side, so they fell down together. Wherefore that place was called Halkazarethim, which is in Gibeon. All of them died. All of them died. This was an inconclusive contest. So the next step is nothing more than just general battle. 17. And there was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel before the servants of David. So Abner loses. David's army has won this battle. And uh, Abner's army is now in retreat. And there were three sons of Jeriah, Joab, and Abishai, and Asahel. And Asahel was as light of foot as a wild rope. And Asahel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the right hand, nor to the left, from following Abner. And then Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou Asahel? And he answered, I am. So Joab has these two brothers with him. And they're all chasing after Abner because they want to capture him. Now Asahel is the fastest of the two of the three brothers. And he's faster than Abner as well. At verse 21 it says, And Abner said unto him, Turn thee aside to the right hand, or to the left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following of him. So Abner is advising him, stop following me. If you want to fight, go over there and grab this guy's armor. Which I find really interesting because they just fought at battle. Why did this young warrior not have any armor on? Now, the Bible is not exactly clear on this, but you can extrapolate that probably he removed his armor in order to travel quicker, in order to catch up quicker. Um... Abner himself may also have removed his armor in order to stay ahead as well. Now the young man is a great warrior, but Abner knows that he is the greater warrior. He's cautioning him, turn aside. And Abner said again to Asahel, turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab, thy brother? This young warrior, he's overconfident and he's arrogant. He's seeking glory for himself. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that in his mind he's thinking, if I pull this off, I'll be put on the right hand of King David. Never considering the possible consequences of his actions. Now, Abner doesn't really want to kill Asahel. Not because he's a good guy or anything. He's not. But he knows that Joab will seek revenge for the death of his brother. In 23, Howbeit he refused to turn aside. Wherefore Abner, with the hinder end of the spear, smote him from under the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Asahel fell down and died, stood still. The young man might have been faster than Abner, but Abner was more experienced and more skilled. Abner knew ahead of time how the fight was going to go down. The young warrior was too blinded by visions of glory that he couldn't see past his own success. Amen. Verse 24, Joab also and Abishai pursued after Abner and son of them when they were come to the hill of Amah that lieth before Gia and the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. 
And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop and stood on top of a hill. Then Abner called Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? And Joab said, As God liveth, unless thou hast spoken, surely then, in the morning the people had gone up, every one from following his brother. So Joab blew a trumpet, and the people stood still and pursued after Israel no more. Neither fought they any more. And Abner and his men walked all the night through the plain and passed over Jordan and went through all Bithran and they came to Mahanaim. And Joab returned from following Abner. And when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servants, nineteen men and Asahel. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men, so that three hundred and threescore men died. And they took up Asahel and buried him in the sepulchre of his father, which was in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at break of day. Abner was correct about one thing. Eventually, Joab is going to kill him for his brother's death. He'd kill Abner the same way that Abner killed his brother. And in the end, that vengeance will cost Joab his life. These were not good men. None of them were. Sitting back and having a blast as 24 young men hack each other to pieces. And the 300 common people, common families, dying in a battle. This is what a life of sin brings you. Amen. We need to remember that the word evil is only one letter short of its source, the devil. In many ways, Abner and Joab, they're not the most important people in this chapter. They're not, I mean, they're important people, but they're not necessarily the most. I contend that Asahel was. We need to remember that there are different types of literature in the Bible. There's narrative, which is telling a story. There's discourse, which is direct debate and communication between people. And then in the Bible, there is poetry. But with all three of these, there's imagery. Asahel represents the life of the unsaved individual. And Abner represents a form of Satan. You shouldn't give Abner any sort of credit because he didn't want to kill the young warrior. He would have been just as happy to do it, but for him it was the course of least trouble. The young man was chasing after Abner for his own glory. He is the picture of a young man with great potential with ability, and a future who lost it. Because instead of surrendering his abilities to God, he used them for himself. Yep. There are so many people out there who could be used by God, but they can't stop chasing personal glory. Amen. Abner gave him multiple warnings. Stop the chase. Turn aside. But he couldn't let it go. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are just like Asahel, chasing after the devil. How many times do you have to be warned to stop the chase? Amen. Eventually, the chances to turn aside will end. Chase ends with your death, both physically and spiritually. Joab eventually kills Abner, and King David says at his funeral that Abner died a fool. If you continue in sin, you're going to die a fool. Amen. 
Every minute, moment you hold out on being saved, you're wasting the gifts that God gave you. That's right. Your youth, your talent, could all be used for the glory of God. You have the choice today to end your chase and be eternally saved. To be able to talk to God every day and be indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you believe on Jesus today, then God will hear you. In John 9 and 31, it says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. The question is, what does it take to be saved? In John 3.16, the plan of salvation is made perfectly crystal clear Amen. for all time. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. That's right. God will never take it from you. In Romans 11 and 29, the Bible says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God will never repent of the gift that He has given you. In Ephesians 2 and 8, it makes it very crystal clear, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Salvation is the gift of God, not of works, and He'll never repent of it. It's not about us or what we've done, it's about what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. The being saved is not a license to go out and sin. Amen. In Romans 6 and 1 it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. I talked earlier about the trials of life. One thing I didn't say is that God uses the trials of life to wake up the unsaved and let them know that He is the Lord thy God. Amen. Choice is, all, choice is always ours. Stop chasing the devil and turn around. Turn towards Jesus. So if you want to be saved today, all you have to do is believe on the name of Jesus Christ as your Savior.